Hello, everybody. We are live. Gonna test the audio real quick. Cool. It's working. All right. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Welcome to Humboldt Redwood State Park. We are about to go on in just a moment. Just gonna let a few more people join us. It's a pretty warm evening. It was a sweltering day here at Humboldt Redwood State Park, and the voice you're hearing right now is Interpreter Ryan, and we are joined by Interpreter Abigail. Hi. Hi there. Good evening, everyone. Welcome. <laughs> thank you, thank you. We have a small audience here, um, and I'm really excited to be with you all tonight um, here at Humboldt Redwood State Park. So welcome to you all uh, from the North Coast Redwoods District. Once again, my name is Abigail, and I am a seasonal interpreter here this summer for California State Parks, as well as a student of interpretation at Humboldt State University. And I'm so excited to be presenting this virtual campfire program tonight for you all. So I think without further ado, we're gonna, we're gonna go ahead and get started. So like we said, today I am streaming uh, to you live here from Humboldt Redwoods State Park in Southern Humboldt. Um, I just wanna acknowledge that we stand on Weot tribal land here at Humboldt Redwoods State Park, and that this is also the home of the largest remaining stand of old growth redwood trees in the entire world. And so Ryan, if you even just wanna pan around to where we are, this Absolutely. is a really special place. And this is a beautiful time of day to be seeing it as well. I love golden hour in the Redwood Forest. One last little look up there. Yeah, so thank you so much for joining me tonight for this virtual campfire program where I'm gonna be talking about the journey of old growth redwoods to second growth and back again. Um, and before we start, um, I do just want to thank you all for tuning in from home um, and for doing your part during this COVID-19 pandemic um, to stay safe and stay socially distanced and shelter in place. Um, we really appreciate you tuning in and uh, visiting our parks the way that you can. Um, and here at the parks, we're also really trying to do our part to take all sorts of COVID precautions from um, respecting six to 10 foot social distancing, asking everyone, oh, of course I can't find my mask, asking <laughs> everyone to carry masks around the park and wear them when you're around other people um, on trails and et cetera. And also um, just wiping down all of our work equipment and just making sure that um, we, can, we can work and play safely in our parks and stay healthy. So thank you for doing your part and we hope to see you out here in the parks again sometime soon. So in tonight's 30 minute program, uh, we will follow the journey of old growth redwoods uh, to second growth and back again. I will discuss why old growth redwood forests are so incredibly special, how old growth turns into second growth, and then how second growth can finally turn back into old growth once again. If you have any questions or comments at any time during this live stream, please just leave a comment um, in our comment section online and I Ryan will be helping me check comments throughout the program <laughs> And if I don't get to them during the program, I will definitely look be looking at them afterwards So please leave comments. I really look forward um, to hearing all of your questions and thoughts um, So just to start we have a beautiful picture of an old-growth uh, Coast Redwood Forest right here. How many people in the audience you can raise your hand even though I won't be able to see you, have been to a Coast Redwood Forest before. Everybody who's here with me today has been to a Coast Redwood Forest, which is awesome. Um, and if so, I would like to, you to take a moment to yourself to think about what your experience was like. And in your mind's eye, uh, try to take yourself back there. And if you'd like to, you can comment one word about what your experience was like in the Facebook comments as well as uh, where you're watching from tonight if you would like to. So I'll give everybody a few minutes to think about that and come up with a word. And it might just take a second. There's a little bit of a delay on our Facebook Live, but. Mm -hmm. 
And this is really just an opportunity for you to think back to the last time that you might have been in the redwoods um, and, and just kind of try to remind yourself of what a, what a special, special place any, any redwood forest is. And I, I feel really lucky to be here right now. I think my word for this moment in the redwood forest for me would be peaceful. Um, even though we have some kind of bird squawking, it sounds like a crow. I still think the atmosphere is just really peaceful. So that's my word. We've got um, Mark Graham says awestruck. Awestruck. That's a fantastic word, I think. Does anybody else in the audience today have a word you'd like to offer? Majestic. Majestic. That's a fantastic word for the Redwoods, I think. How about you? What I love about the Redwoods is this, the smell. That's a great word. Yeah, the smell. It, I, I also love the scent of the Redwoods. We have magical, that's what Lori says, and Nancy says memorable. Magical and memorable. These are all really, really good words. And so, yeah, the Redwood Forest in general is really special. And today we're going to be talking about old growth redwood forests. And so in general, uh, what an old growth forest is, is an intact native forest ecosystem wherever that might uh, belong on the, on, on the earth. Um, obviously different tree species grow in different places around the earth and the old growth forests are so special because they have never been cut down, logged or otherwise um, significantly disturbed. And so they're the intact native forest ecosystems. And here on, on the north coast of California, our native forest ecosystem is the coast redwood forest. And there are three reasons today that I'm going to be talking about why the old growth redwood forest is so incredibly special, even amongst all of our old growth forests worldwide that are really special. And those three reasons are that old growth redwood forests are tall, they are complex, and they are rare. So we're going to start by talking about how tall old growth redwood forests are, which I'm sure if you've ever visited, you have definitely noticed. And so this is a view um, up into the canopy, kind of like uh, the one that Ryan was giving you a little bit earlier. Um, so old growth redwoods, old growth coast redwoods, or Sequoia sempervirens, which is the scientific name, are the tallest tree species in the entire world, uh, which is mind boggling before you even start thinking about numbers, because I know that in my life I have seen some really tall trees. Um, and so just thinking that that trees can be quite a bit taller than the ones that I see all the time makes me feel really, really small. Mm -hmm. um, and another word I would probably use for the redwood forest is humbling, um, just because of that, because I, I end up feeling so small here. Um, so the average height of, an, of a mature coast redwood tree is about 200 feet tall, which is also the average wingspan of a commercial jetliner and so if you just think you put a commercial plane on its side and that height is, is the average height for, for a mature coast redwood, but then some of our tallest coast redwoods can actually exceed 350 feet, which is longer than um, an American football field, which is about 300 feet long, taller than the Statue of Liberty, which is 308 feet. And so this just keeps on blowing my mind. Um, and right now, currently the tallest known redwood tree in the world, which is somewhere in Redwood National Park um, in a secret location just for resource protection purposes, is 379 feet tall at the last time that was measured. And so to say the least, coast redwoods are very tall. They are the tallest trees in the entire world. And some of these tallest trees are actually going to exceed 1500 years old. And so apart from being really tall, these, these trees are able to get so tall because they're able to, to stay around for so long um, without falling over or otherwise dying or different things like that. And so there are really long lifespans as well as just enormous amounts of biomass that coast redwoods um, grow in the forest. Coast redwoods are really special because they um, and old growth coast redwoods in particular, they actually sequester about three times as much carbon 
as the average tree species. And so when we're talking about climate action, old growth redwood forest is incredibly powerful for carbon sequestration and trying to pull in carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and store it in biomass. So redwood coast redwoods are really tall, but another reason that uh, old growth coast redwood forests are so special is that they're incredibly complex. And I think one of the reasons that our old growth redwood forests are so famous is for its really tall trees. But not all of the redwoods in the forest are necessarily going to be that big. And so this is a picture I took a few weeks ago of some redwood sproutlings that were not even as tall as my forearm, the tallest ones. And so these were just some baby redwoods that had actually sprouted out of another fallen log. And these are, this is how redwoods start. Um, and this is also in an old growth forest, which is, which is really cool. So, um, Old growth forests are, are really special because they are complex. And one of the ways that they are so complex is that they have a huge diversity of different types of trees. So you're gonna have huge, big, old redwood trees. You're gonna have really young, tiny ones. You have some vertical trees, some horizontal trees that have already fallen over. You have live trees, you have dead trees. You have trees that are growing up straight. You have trees that have wacky limbs growing off of them. And so just that diversity creates such a complexity in the forest that um, that is one of the things that makes the old growth coast redwood forest uh, really, really special. So if you notice any of those characteristics of diversity and you notice lots of different ages and shapes and sizes of trees, even if they're not coast redwoods, it's probably an old growth forest because that really diverse, complex, um, forest structure and composition is one of the things that really marks the old growth forests. Another thing that the diversity um, does for the old growth redwood forest is, here we go, is create a really complex and layered forest canopy. And so when you have a lot of different trees of different ages, they're all going to be different sizes and different heights. And so um, the canopy is going to end up looking like this where it has a lot of different a lot of different layers um, and so I Want you to look at this picture for about 20 seconds and I want you to think of What benefits a layered canopy might have for the old growth coast redwood forest? Um, you can leave a comment on Facebook. You can discuss with someone if you're watching with someone else at home and I just want you to think about why it might help the forest to have such a complex and layered forest canopy overhead. Are you able to see the photo okay? Mm-hmm. We see it pretty well. I'm gonna actually move over to cool. the real canopy here. The real canopy. And so there are a whole bunch of reasons that having a layered and complex forest canopy really benefits the old growth redwood forest. And the one that I'm going to focus on today is light. So I, this is one of my favorite pictures I think I've ever taken in the forest because this is one of my favorite things to see is the bright green light. Um, with with sunlight shining through it through the redwood canopy and this is really something that you only get in the old growth redwood forest because of that layered and complex canopy more sunlight is able to to filter in through the trees even though it does get pretty shady and and dark in the redwood forest and you get that nice cooler microclimate sunlight can still filter through and help these smaller tree species underneath the redwoods grow as well as um, other understory species. And so you can see here there's three really clear layers um, that I thought did a really good job of demonstrating just how important it can be um, to have a spaced out enough old growth redwood forest that light can hit the ground. And so in this picture, for example, we have such this huge lush understory of sword ferns underneath there, which are kind of the those are going to be the largest fern species um, that are typically in a redwood understory. 
Um, some of my other favorite understory species that are a little bit smaller. In the middle we have redwood sorrel, which looks like a three-leaf clover and is pink on underneath, um, which is kind of fun if you see that on the trail. And then we have this very lacy, dainty lady fern on the left-hand side and deer fern, which is the darker green fern in the middle, and it got its name because deer like to eat it. And so that brings me to another reason that the old growth redwood forest is so special and that it's so important that there's so much diversity and complexity and layers. And that is because when we have such a, such a diversity of different plants in the old growth forest, we can support a lot of other species. And so this is um, a species of fungus. I don't know exactly what species it is, but um, fungi are decomposers. And so they feed on all of the dead organic material in the redwood forest. And so when you have old growth redwood forests that have both vertical and horizontal living and dead trees, there's a lot of really great habitat for all sorts of different fungi um, to to feed on and decompose a lot of our dead organic matter. And so this guy right here, this fun guy, is growing on a fallen log. It doesn't look like a redwood, but um, it's definitely the same idea that just with complexity, you, got, you get a lot more opportunities for different habitats. Everybody's favorite redwood forest decomposer, the banana slug. These guys uh, crawl around on trails of slime, which is pretty cool. Um, but in general, uh, banana slugs kind of avoid eating redwoods. Um, and so it works really, really well for banana slugs to have a diversity of other um, understory plants around for them to be able to have lots of different things to eat. Um, and uh, these are just one of, my, one of my favorite animals because I think they're adorable. And they're also really important for, for decomposition in the forest, um, which, which is really cool. And the final animal that I will be talking about today that really benefits from having a complex old growth redwood forest is the black-tailed deer. Um, I saw this one up at Cleary Creek Redwood State Park several weeks ago, and you can see that this looks like a female to me. Um, I might be wrong, but she looks like she's very much enjoying this really lush um, understory and deer eat deer fern, as I mentioned, as well as a bunch of other um, a bunch of other plant species in in the understory. And so, uh, not only is having a layered canopy really important to provide habitat and space and light for those understory plants, but then those understory plants in turn provide a lot of habitat for a lot of other species um, that make our coast, our coast redwood old growth forest really, really special. And um, taking a look up really quick, some of our trees are so tall and when you have this layered sort of canopy, um, when needles fall from taller trees, they can actually get caught um, in the branches of trees lower down and basically create like floating islands of soil way up in in the canopy and so that's this is what um, this picture is trying to show is that there are these little soil mats that are caught way up in the canopy um, and will basically serve as forest floor but way up there and so fern species can grow way up in the canopy um, some species of um, animals as well will never even come down to the actual forest floor. They can spend their entire life up in that redwood forest canopy. Um, one such species is the northern spotted owl, um, which is pretty cute. This one kind of looks like a deer caught in headlights or something, um, but they have huge eyes. They're mostly nocturnal um, and they're really cute, but unfortunately they're a federally listed threatened species. Um, because their habitat, the old growth uh, coast redwood forest, um, is, is not around as much as it used to be. And so um, the, the final reason that we're going to be talking about today um, in connection to the northern spotted owl is uh, the final reason that the old growth coast redwood forest is so special is that it is very rare nowadays. 
So all of this um, on the left side here used to be the original range of coast redwoods here in California. Unfortunately, nowadays, only about 5% of the original coast redwood range of old growth actually <laughs> remains. Only about 5%, which means that 95% is no longer around. Um, and about 35% of that remaining range is actually protected here in the North Coast Redwoods District, um, whether in Humboldt Redwood State Park or some of the um, parks nearby here or up north in uh, Redwood National and State Parks. Um, but there's, whenever I think of Redwoods, there is definitely an immense sense of loss of the, the fact that we only have um, about 5% of what we used to have remaining, which amounts to a little bit over 100,000 acres. And if, if, you, if any of you are familiar with the city of San Jose in the San Francisco Bay Area, that's about the size of San Jose is the amount of coast redwood old growth forest um, that we have left. And then on the right side here is zoomed in on um, our north coast redwoods district up here. And it's kind of hard to see on the screen um, but this is a map from one of our uh, parks partners, Save the Redwoods League. And so if you go on their website, you can also find this map. And it just shows really clearly um, where, where the historic range was and how much is left today. So we know that coast redwoods are rare. We know that old growth coast redwoods are rare um, because there's only 5% left, but where did 95% of those go? And how does old growth forest become second growth forest? Um, before I go on this, oh, you really can't see that on the screen, I guess, that's fine. Um, the, what I was gonna say about this map, this is a map of Redwood National and State Parks. And so even within our protected area that protects 35% of the remaining old growth coast redwood forest, uh, the old growth within this park is really fragmented. And so if you, if you ever see um, this map again, there are paper copies floating around all of our parks and it's also available online. You'll see that there's darker green sections surrounded by a whole bunch of lighter green around the edges. And that lighter green represents second growth forest, whereas the dark green represents old growth. And so this map makes it really clear that even within our protected lands, old growth redwoods are still really fragmented. Um, but we still haven't gotten to exactly how that happens or how old growth redwood forest becomes second growth in the first place. And the short answer is clear cut logging is how a large um, portion of historic old growth coast redwood forest turned into the second growth forest that we know today. Second growth just meaning that um, the intact native ecosystem that used to be there um, was logged or clear cut or significantly disturbed in some way and has then been reseeded at some point and has regrown. And so a second growth forest is what replaces an old growth forest after it's logged or otherwise removed. And so this picture is from within the boundaries of Redwood National State Parks, actually in the 1960s. And so logging um, occurred within, um, on, along here in our um, North Coast Redwoods District from about the mid um, 1800s to the mid 1900s and the, um, the arrival of Europeans right around that time not only really eliminated a lot of our intact native ecosystem, but also unfortunately eliminated a lot of our native people of this area. And so that, um, that portion of history is, is marked with a lot of tragedy and um, a lot of devastation, um, ecological and otherwise. Um, but the, this type of photo always just, um, it leaves me speechless, clearly, yeah. Um, here's another one that is similar, and one thing that really strikes me about this photo of clear cut is that you can see um, in the front here how this soil is really compacted, 
and kind of looks like something has been dragged along it. And so that might be an example of a skid road, which is how um, logging companies would actually remove the lumber that they had cut down from certain areas. Um, and so that compacts a lot of soil as well as brings up a lot of sediment and things like that. Um, but honestly, before I had come across these pictures, I hadn't really ever experienced the reality of what a clear cut really looks like. And so I wanted to share that um, with all of you. I think these images are really powerful. And not only was there um, the environmental change that went on due to, due to clear cuts in the 19th and 20th centuries, um, this is a really, a really powerful photo, but it doesn't, it doesn't show everything that was going on. Um, and there's definitely things missing from this photo um, that I think this photo demonstrates about the environmental change that was going on at that time. And the growth of cities was really the biggest one that I thought of, was that here you see um, where all of this lumber is taken from, but it doesn't really speak to why clear cutting was going on at that time, why logging was going on at that time, and why there was such a need for lumber. But um, a lot of the cities and highways and infrastructure that all of this lumber um, was cut down in order to provide are still around today. Here um, on the North Coast, as well as down in San Francisco and elsewhere kind of around the American West. And so I, I think it's really important when looking at really striking photos like this to always ask yourself what is missing and what is what is left out of the photo. Um, something else that I think is striking about this is that there are no people in this in this picture. Um, and obviously people have left their mark. Um, but that's just always something I like thinking about is is what is missing. So this is just my final picture to talk about logging um, and you can really see the scale of how enormous that upper log is compared to the smaller ones um, that are underneath. And so like I said after an area is clear cut a second growth forest is what replaces um, the original forest and so after this area on the top would have been reseeded um, in the past 50 or 60 years because this area was also logged in, in the 1960s. This is near Lady Bird Johnson Grove up in Redwood National Park now. Um, so they're, they're reseeded often from, from plains. Um, they're aerially reseeded and then you get second growth forest. But second growth forests really do not feel or look like old growth redwood forests because they have quite a different structure and composition. So I will let you just observe this photo for a moment and try to make some observations about what looks different from the pictures that we were looking at a little while ago. And Ryan might also might be showing you our, our surroundings here in Humboldt Redwoods. Because we have both. Because we have both. We got some second growth. Yeah. And we've got old growth. Wow, we're in a great spot for this. <laughs> <laughs> and, and if I can add something, uh, there's a campground just over here. So it's kind of just, you can kind of see that even within our parks, a lot of times the campgrounds are, are situated in areas that were previously logged. Mm -hmm. Areas that, um, you know, we tend not to put our campgrounds in the middle of old growth forests. Um, with the exception of, of maybe Jebediah Smith and Prairie yeah. Creek a little bit. Yeah. And so here is another picture of, an, of a second growth forest. Um, the biggest thing that I really notice is that all the trees are the same size, which is completely the antithesis to what we were talking about earlier with the incredible complexity and layers and diversity of the old growth forest. Um, to me, this kind of looks, these all kind of look like toothpick trees, and I think that's kind of a funny way to think about um, second growth forest, is that um, since all of the trees were planted at the same time, they're all going to be about the same size, they're all going to be about the same age, about the same height, um, and so you're, you're not going to get that diversity of different, 
uh, trees of different ages and different sizes and shapes like we were looking at earlier um, where the really tiny redwood sprouts are are growing right next to some of the tallest coast redwood trees in the world um, and another thing about planting redwoods in in a second growth context that you can see really clearly from this picture is that this this forest is way too dense it's i think it it makes sense to call it a toothpick forest because they're the trees looks like they're packed in like toothpicks and they're all really skinny straight up and down um, and so second growth forests can actually be up to 10 times as dense as their old growth counterparts. And so let's say if in an old growth forest, you would have 10 redwood trees on an acre. In a second growth forest, you might have 100 trees in that same amount of space, which means that the trees are having to compete a, a great deal more just with each other for light and for water and for nutrients and for those sorts of things. And so the trees aren't going to be able to get as tall or as large. And that's one of the reasons they all look so small and scrawny. Um, but another reason that having such a dense canopy is not a good thing is, again, going back to our discussion about old growth, is light. And so when light can't come through the canopy like it can under old growth conditions, then you don't get as much of a lush understory at all. Like in this picture, I mean, maybe I see a few plants and obviously there's a little bit of light coming through, but for a large part, the forest is just a bunch of trees all really crammed together, um, all competing with one another. And without any of those understory plants, then you don't have any of the diverse habitats for the other, other species um, that live on the forest floor as well. And so just to summarize, second growth forests are less tall less complex um, and just less rich and less diverse than the old growth forests that preceded them. Um, and this is, what, this is what generally replaces our old growth conditions after they're logged and then start growing back. Um, so that makes me kind of sad, but can we, can, is there any way that we could bring our old growth conditions back and I guess my wording kind of gives it away, but yes, we can. And so how can second growth redwood forests become old growth again? And how do we bring these old growth conditions back? So the easy answer, as I'm getting to the end of my program here, is restorative thinning. Um, so on the left-hand side here is a picture from 2012. Um, I believe this is also somewhere in Redwood National and State Parks. And then on the right side is the same grove about three years later in 2015 after they did some restorative and selective thinning in this area. And so um, crews will go out into the forest and based on their knowledge of forestry and tree health and different things like that, they will identify individuals that would be better to be removed. So it's just like in your garden bed, um, if you decide to thin a plant in order to let the ones that are remaining kind of um, grow more and have a little bit more space, it's the exact same idea here. It's just on a much larger scale because as we started with talking about today, redwoods are really big. And so this is a really big job um, to undertake but it makes a really, really big difference. And you can even just see between these photos um, how much more light is gonna be coming in through the canopy and what, what sorts of impacts those are gonna have um, on our forest. And so just to wrap up today, uh, one of the reasons I wanted to do my talk uh, today on this topic is that just this summer, um, an unprecedentedly large scale second growth forest project has started up north in Redwood National and State Parks, um, which is really, really exciting. So where we are right now, Humboldt Redwood State Park currently has the largest remaining stand of old growth redwood trees left anywhere in the world. And the second and largest stands are located up at Redwood National and State Parks. And so one of the things that this uh, restoration project, which is called Redwoods Rising, is trying to do is to actually um, reunite the second and third largest remaining stands of old growth redwoods 
to then make what, what would be the new largest remaining old growth stand. And it's not a competition amongst our parks or anything like that. It's more so um, that we're just really trying to take advantage of this opportunity to build more ecological resilience and um, kind of defragment our, our redwood ecosystem, um, both for, for our plants and for our animals and just for um, ecological resilience in general. And so Redwoods Rising um, is going to try to restore about 80,000 acres of second growth redwood forest up in Redwood National and State Parks. It started just a couple of months ago. Um, and California State Parks and the National Park Service are partnering with um, a nonprofit called Save the Redwoods League. Um, they're our main partner in this Redwoods Rising project. Um, and so there are restoration teams out in the field almost every day right now um, up in Redwood National and State Parks and we really could not um, undertake this big of an effort without this really strong partnership that we have going on with California State Parks, the National Park Service, Save the Redwoods League, many other um, tribal and NGO partners as well as our staff and all of our visitors who come out here um, to our parks and, and just continue to support um, what we're trying to do out here. And so if you are interested um, in getting at any, any more involved with Redwoods Rising, if you want more information or you want to know different ways that you can get involved, you could visit redwoodsrising.org and that will take you to the Save the Redwoods League website. Um, and there's a whole bunch of other information online through Save the Redwoods League, California State Parks, and the National Park Service if you're interested in any of what I've discussed today. Um, and I hope you have learned something. I'm about to wrap up here. So in general, bringing our second growth forests back to old growth conditions are really important for a number of reasons. For habitat, for wildlife, um, for climate resilience, for ecological, um, ecological, uh, what's the word, just being intact, having all of our ecosystems be really intact. And then also um, one thing that I have been reflecting on a lot lately is that restoration is a form of healing. And I think 2020 is a really important time that um, people are trying to heal in a lot of different ways from a lot of different challenges. And um, second growth forest restoration, I think can be a really powerful way that we can try to heal from tragedies and from devastation and from, from pain that has happened in the past and to hopefully um, continue on into the future with a, more, um, with a more hopeful legacy. And so that's kind of the note that I would like to leave you with today. Again, my name is Abigail and I really, really appreciate you joining me for tonight's virtual campfire program here at Humboldt Redwoods State Park. And so, yeah, without further ado, um, I'm gonna sign off for the night here pretty quick. Please leave any questions or comments on Facebook and tune in again next week at 7 p.m. We're giving a virtual campfire program through California State Parks every Saturday night of August. And so be sure to tune in again and we'll hope to see you next time. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Do you have a moment to um, respond to any questions, if there are any? Yeah, absolutely. And before we do, um, just uh, somebody from, I guess, the Bay Area, Nancy, um, just made a comment earlier regarding logging, which was really interesting, that logging in my, in my town, Oakland, California, happens to, um, happened to help rebuild San Francisco after 1906, which I think they're talking about the earthquake there. Yeah, absolutely. The logging trail to bring the fallen trees down to the bay is still a significant road through Oakland Park Boulevard. Wow, I didn't know that. That's really, really interesting. Yeah, and so I think a lot of what I was talking about today with um, the logging and Redwoods history here on, on the North Coast in particular, um, and with that, I'm talking about kind of Mendocino, Humboldt, and Del Norte counties. A lot of what I said is definitely true um, farther south in California and definitely around the San Francisco Bay Area and in the Santa Cruz um, and East Bay Mountains as well. Definitely. Thank you for sharing. Perfect. Well, it looks like I think that's about it. So thank you so much, Abigail. Cool.
And thank you, Facebook, Facebook land. land. And we'll see you next week. And, of course, we see you every day for our 3 o'clock Facebook Lives. Goodbye.